Paizo has released the Galaxy Exploration Manual. It's been out for a little while now, but it's been a little difficult to get my hands on a physical copy. If you're watching this, you're probably wanting to know, is it worth it? Should I pick this up? And is it any good? Well, I'm hoping to answer all of those questions about the Galaxy Exploration Manual and give my thoughts, my review on this. Let's get into it. Hello everyone, welcome to the table, my name's Nathaniel. This is a channel where we discuss your favorite role-playing games in the Paizoverse, as well as World of Darkness. If that's something you're interested in, I would love to have you join me at the table. First things first, if you're looking to pick this up, there are several things that this book is, there are many things that this book is and what it covers, and there is a couple things that it does not. The Galaxy Exploration Manual, or the gem as I'm going to refer to it from here on out, because it is, it is a gem. It is the closest thing to a Dungeon Master's Guide that exists currently for Starfinder. But even saying that doesn't really encapsulate what this book is about. So what's in this book and who is it designed to target? What you will find when you get into the book is you will find some character creation background, some tables that you can use for character creation, how to create a better backstory if it's something that you're struggling with. These tables are all the D100 percentage dice, so you need two D10s to roll these. For new players and folks who are new to Starfinder who are just starting a new campaign, this could be a good source for you for some interesting character stories, or at least to give you some ideas if you don't know what to do. It also gives some ideas on how a party can know each other. Maybe you're not all starting from square one. Maybe you all know each other or some of each other from some place. And this does give you some ideas on a table on that as well. These are great ideas, not just for Starfinder, although you may have to tweak some of the information in these tables if you want to use them for a different game, but they are usable in this way. After the character creation tables, we're getting into some more of the meat for players. There are some different class options that you can take for every single class that exists up until this point. Biohackers, envoys, mystics, mechanics, operatives, solarians, Soldiers, Technomancers, Vanguard, and the Witch Warper, they all have some new features to their class, some new whole skill sets that you can use, and all of them are geared around specifically exploration and doing sandbox. I found that some of them were a little situational, at least as I interpreted them when I was reading them. I could be wrong about that. Some of them will definitely have use no matter what type of game you're playing. Next comes some starship options. So there are new systems designed specifically for exploring and mapping out new planets, scanning new planets, if you will, so that you can find out what's on them. There's also some new downtime activities that are geared again towards exploring a planet and learning more about it. Very useful when you jump out of the drift for your party and you're randomly over a new planet that you want to learn a little bit more about. I've talked a little bit about the drift, there should be a video here, and there will be one in the description as well. Now from here we start to move into the equipment section. Now throughout this book there is dispersed items and feats and different magical spells. The back of the book does have an index for these as well, so you know what page they're on and exactly what you're looking for like spells or feats, whatever. It is documented at the back with some nice pictures and it makes things somewhat easy to find so that you know that it's in the book, but you don't have to do a ton of digging to find it. And again, some of the feats and the magical spells, I feel that they're quite situational as well. Not all of them. Many of them are designed around the concept of this book, which was exploration. So if you're not doing that in your campaign, if you're not actively going out and exploring new worlds, you may not get as much value from your characters out of this as you would maybe something else like the Character Operations Manual. I've also reviewed that one, so the link will be in the description as well. The back half of this book is dedicated to world building. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what's in there and just why it's so amazing and why it needs half the book. Before we get into that, if you are finding some value out of today's video, I would encourage you to hit the subscribe button as well as the bell notification so that you never miss a video when I release it. Even though the YouTube bell notification doesn't really work ever. <laughs> now the world building section is phenomenal. This is very, very meaty stuff. Keep in mind, these are all optional systems. They're not new rules that you can layer in for complexities of your game. They are simply tools for a dungeon master or a game master to 
create planets on the fly. Now Paizo released a accessory to their game called the Deck of Many Worlds, and it does kind of accomplish the same thing. This is a little less expensive and it's easier to create some planets on the fly, but if you're looking for something that just takes your planet building or your world building and just takes it to the next level, then you're definitely going to want to get the gem. Now the deck of many worlds will give you a planet type, it will give you some species, and whether it's a high or low tech, just some ideas. Where the gem takes this and absolutely runs with it, is it gives you full fleshed out ideas to create full worlds. We're talking different biomes, desert, aquatic, arctic, boreal, even in space. There are specific, I'm not going to say rules, but there are specific tables that they have that give you some ideas to create planets or spaces for your players to interact with. Not only does it give you those spaces that your players can interact with, it gives you world building ideas around this. It goes right down into the nitty gritty. Once you have a biome and you know what a planet is going to be, it then progresses into a system that Paizo has called a cord. And what they mean by this is how cooperative are your citizens? There is high, medium, and low accord. And Paizo really does try to give you as many ideas as possible around these different levels of agreement. What does society look like when they all agree with each other and when they all disagree with each other and are actively hostile with each other? What kind of magic exists in this society or on this world? Is it a high, medium, or low magic society? And then again, they go into ideas on each of these concepts. What does a society look like when it has high magic? What does a society look like when they are low or medium magic? What are the types of things that you can run into or that you should expect? Not the end all be all, but definitely enough to get the thought process going. They also try to give you as many ideas as they can around the religious beliefs of, of a society. How religious are they? How much technology exists within this society? I would argue that you wouldn't want uh, a high magic and a high tech society. I mean, you could do that. Just for me personally, I would usually have one or the other. But it's your worlds, you do what you want. These are the tools that Paizo has created for you. And even within these sections, after they've given you all of these ideas, all of these ways that a society would work given the specific thing you're looking at, religion, technology, whatever. In each of these sections, Paizo then takes it one step further for the GM by giving you a plot hook table. What kind of adventures could you run in these types of societies? They have plot hooks for your high, medium, and low range options in all of these categories. They have even added an alignment section. For better or worse, whatever your opinion on the alignment system is, there is one in it. What does a society look like when it is lawful good, when it is chaotic evil? What do corporations look like when they fit inside these boxes or inside this grid of the alignment system? Whether you actively use it or not, it is there for ideas. These tools in the hands of even an uninspired GM will not go to waste. Once Paizo finished getting through showing you how to build great worlds with in-depth societies, they take it one step further and then they show you as a GM how to design a whole campaign, how to design a campaign setting. One of the biggest things to talk about when you're designing an exploration-based setting, a sandbox setting, is having a home base for your players. And this would either be your starship, primarily, because this one moves with you, or you would have some home base somewhere, maybe exploring a whole system. I can see something being done around that. Once they lay out the framework of what a setting would look like, they then help you fill that out with what should an adventure look like? What should an encounter look like? They have encounter tables in these books as well. Did I mention there's a lot of tables? There's almost a table on every page. Not quite true, but there are a lot of tables. Paizo also included a lot of their inspirations for the various ideas, their subgenres of sci-fi, if you will, which they titled subgenres. They give specific references to movies, books, anything that related to the specific setting that was their own inspiration. These are not the end-all be-alls of the subgenres, but again, Use your inspiration, draw from your various sources. 
As we get towards the end of the book, there are more tables for NPC creation. Names, species, it's all very good stuff to have because I now I don't have to create my own lists. There's also more tables for settlement creations, names of those settlements, important areas that you might want to visit within those settlements, and names and types of establishments that they are, like a butcher or a tavern, a space tavern. Lots of tables to help with not only your adventure design, but your games and your encounters as well. And once you get through all of that, that brings you basically to the end of the book. So here's a couple of things that I really liked about Gem. For me, I've never really used tables before, so I liked having access, easy access to tables. Rather than trying to create something on my own, it gives me some nice tools for easy access on the fly. One of the other things that I liked around this was the sheer number of plot hooks and the ideas for plot hooks that they have given. I've never really struggled with ideas for creating a story, but I have found some challenges in keeping that story going. I also really liked the world building tools. What biome is your planet? What does a society look like? And what kind of technology and magic religion influences their decision? Even their moral compass if you choose to use the alignment system. Some of the things that I did not like with this book, and I feel that they're mostly minor, some tables have the option to reroll twice on them. For example, if you get the bottom percentiles, one or two percent, and then the top percentiles, 99 or 100 percent, they both have the reroll on this table option. I don't know why you would need two of those on there. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't used tables before, so I know that in some cases a reroll on this table is is used. I'm not sure if it's worthwhile having it on there twice, though. At least from my own mind, why reroll? Just have two more options in there, and then you don't have to do anything different on the table. It's more nitpicky on my end, and I again don't have a lot of experience with using pre-generated tables for my games, and I'm definitely planning to start using these ones. One thing that I also did not appreciate with my physical copy, and this is really isn't the fault of Paizo, but my book actually has a misprint in it. I got pages 41 through 48 twice. I don't know how well you can see this, but you go from page 40 here to 41, 42, 43, and then you get the cross fold cover art, which this is this is some really nice art. 46, 47, 48, back to 41, and then it just redoes those pages again until we get back to 49 on this side. So it's just an interesting misprint on this one. The only other negative that I can say around this book is I wish it was longer. It's about 163 pages when you don't count in the misprint that I got of the duplicated pages. But if you look at some of the other supplements that are coming out for Pathfinder, Pathfinder 2E specifically, the Advanced Player's Guide, as an example, was 60% larger than what this one is. Some of the other Lost Omen guides, they're probably closer to the same size. Maybe a little smaller, I guess. But like with any good supplement that comes out for a role-playing system that you enjoy, you always want more of it. So what are my final thoughts and my final score, and who should pick up the gem? I really enjoyed this supplement. It doesn't really fill in any blanks for me on the lore part of things, but it does give, as a GM, so many campaign creation tools, world building tools, that you don't have to use specifically for Starfinder. If you are a writer and you just need some inspiration or how to create a world, these are excellent tools. They go beyond just creating campaigns in Starfinder. They are excellent tools, no matter what creative outlet you're trying to use them for. You could even use some of these in a Dungeons & Dragons setting if you really, really wanted to. This book is mostly geared towards the GMs and the people who want to build their own adventures. They want to create their own campaigns. If you're running an adventure path, you're not going to get as much use out of this as you would if you were making your own adventures. On the player side of things, you will get some more character options which you could use for your campaigns or your adventure paths that you're running. But I would say if you're looking for more character options, then please go with the character operations manual first and then look at this as a second. 
If you are a GM who is looking to run Starfinder in a sandbox capacity, this is absolutely a 100% must have book for you. My final score for the gem will be a five stars out of five. This is phenomenal book. Paizo has totally done another home run with this. The quality of the writing that's been coming out from Paizo around Starfinder has just been amazing. If you haven't checked out Starfinder yet, I would highly encourage that you do so as this is a phenomenal system and those familiar with D&D 3.5 will be right at home with Starfinder. If you would like to learn a little bit more about Starfinder, I have a playlist on the screen for you now, specifically around Starfinder. I also have my GM series with tips and tricks on how to run not only Starfinder, but any other game. I try to keep my tips as system agnostic as possible. My name's Nathaniel. This has been The Maple Table. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. <laughs>